So then, here it comes. Um, the design of your application before the adoption of EBR. Of course, you never knew anything about it. So application code of various kinds just accessed tables directly. One piece of application might be a view, where the view is defined against tables. Another view might be just a view defined against other views. I don't care. But ultimately, at the root of it all were tables. And we made the point that after the scheme, we have to have an additioning view in front of every table. So now let's confront the point that because we couldn't find a way to have additioning views anywhere except in namespace one, the additioning view and the table it covers, both having the same owner, cannot have the same name. So how can you get an additioning view in place in front of every uh, table? There's only two ways to do it, the stupid way and the natural, convenient and easy way. The stupid way is first to say, I like the names of my tables. I'm not going to touch them. And then you introduce additioning views, which necessarily have other names you've never heard of. And then you go through all your application code, looking for all the references to these, and you change them to the references to the additioning views once and for all. That sounds to be stupid to me, self-evidently stupid. So the other approach is the first thing you do is rename all the tables to names you've never ever heard of before. And since these tables are not going to be accessed by anything apart from additioning views or cross-addition triggers during an EBR exercise, you could well rename them systematically off a sequence. Table 1, table 2, up to table 500. That would work fine. The thing you need to do is to um, install in front of every table an additioning view that has the name that the table used to have before you renamed it. And it, 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 I think it's immediately obvious to you, isn't it, that if you do just that, then all your existing PL SQL that used to talk to tables will now work perfectly fine talking to the additioning views. All the view definitions, whether they refer directly to tables or to other views, will again just be source code compatible with the new world. You won't have to touch them. And of course, it's the same for synonyms. Um, it's not quite the same for triggers because Strange though it might be seen, might seem, you can see this with an experiment. If you rename a table on which a trigger exists, and indeed if you were to rename columns inside it, it all just automatically flips over in some strange way. So to get the triggers in the place you want them, it's simple. Just drop them all and recreate them. Now, if you're sensible enough to be contemplating using EBR, have after having understood it all, chances are that you've got a deployment which is um, governed by, true to, a definition in a source control system. If that's the case, then of course to get your triggers in the right place, you just drop them all and then you um, rerun the script to create them and those scripts will just automatically, by virtue of the way the names are resolved, put them on the additioning views, which is what you want. And the same, by the way, goes for policies of all kinds, VPD policies, fine-grained auditing policies, and new from 12.1, redaction policies. They all mention tables and sometimes columns in tables. The natural thing to do is to have them now at additioning view level. Why do I say that? Why am I so keen on that central rule of proper practice? It's because you want to get the maximum benefit from the apparatus. And as we saw in that thought experiment without any EBR, where you were doing a ton of annoying incidental name changing to get your goal, you want the opposite. You want your code when you didn't think you had to touch it and when you wouldn't have touched it in an offline exercise just to be perfectly viable immediately. right? And if you do what I'm saying, it'll work out nicely like that. If you fight against that and swim against the stream, you can have your policies at bare table level, and it'll still work. It's just you might find, in some cases, the policy becomes meaningless until you rechanged its definition to talk to the table as you've now renamed a few things in it. And that would be kind of silly. You see, that's just not what you want. Um, so that's why, again, we call it a rule of proper practice because we can't force you to do it and if you don't do it you can kind of work around anyway to get the proper result 
and some people would even argue that that's what they like. Um, so that I'll just propose one very obvious scheme, but then I'll so show that even that is slightly flawed. The proposition, the going in position, is that people have got really attached to the names of the tables, and therefore they don't want them just to vanish and be replaced with one, two, three, and so on. So they would like to preserve the original name of the table in some recognizable form. Well, the obvious way to do it is simply to rename every table, and you can do this mechanically, to the lowercase spelling of its formal name. Now, that will only work as a reliable approach if a certain thing is true, but that certain thing seems to be true for every single customer-built application on the whole planet that I've ever heard of. And it's this. If you were to look in DBA objects and filter out Oracle's shipped stuff and look only at what you put there yourself and look at object name, I think you'd find that every object name had that character, we call it a simple name, um, or common name is the term I like to use, has the character that when you refer to it in SQL or in the definition of a synonym, a view, or PL SQL source text, you don't need to put double quotes around it. Okay? Now, there are names. You could have a table called, um, a table which when you looked at it in DBA object, a table whose name was capital M, little y, space, big V, little e, r, y, space, capital O, w, n, space, capital T, a, b, l, e, my very own table, question mark. You could do that. It's a perfectly legal name. You just realize that that's a kind of exotic name, as I like to call it, and you would have to include double quotes around that in a SQL statement or in source code if you wanted the identifier for that name. Yes? And nobody likes to do that. So in practice, the only names you ever see in DBA objects for customer-created things are those common names that you can use without double quoting. Anyone in the room, personal experience of doing anything other than that? Anyone like to use double quotes and give things mixed case? You, all right. Oh, well, yes. I suppose automatically generated things, people do that because they can. Um, it, I don't think you'd be EBR readying automatically generated stuff. In fact, I'm almost convinced you would be, wouldn't be. So that wouldn't be a problem. Anyway, I'm only saying that's something you can do. Uh, many people seem to feel they have to you know, put underscore TAB on the end because it's a table. I don't know why, but they like to do that. If you, if you want to do that kind of thing, you might hit the 30-byte limit unless you think, oh, sod it, I'm so close to the modern world, I'll do all this in 12.2 and enjoy the full 128 bytes. Later, I'll point out there's a good reason for thinking of adopting EBR straight in 12.2 if you're doing it from scratch. I'll say what that is in a minute. It's not the 128-byte story. It's something entirely <coughs> different. Um, Anyway, this is the point. Just suppose whatever scheme you used, you ended up with all your tables having names that you really, really liked, and you thought that they expressed their meaning. Just think what would happen in the first occasion of pivot-style refactoring, the example I used to illustrate a point earlier on, that you have a table that's relatively skinny and very tall, and you realize it's bad because it does attribute name, attribute value, and you want to pivot it around, so it becomes wide and short. Now, you can present it into the application world using the name that you used to by redefining the additioning view, of course, in the new edition to have the different number of columns. That's, what, of course, what you do. But you have to have a base table under the view in both editions. And the base table has got different structure. It needs two separate base tables. Those two tables can't have the same name. If the one you had at the start had the name you like, the one you've got now to replace it can't have that name you like, right? So it's say that applies too for the columns, as we'll see when we do some column widening later on. If a column just had a certain name, like email address, and you realized it was too narrow, you could still preserve the name email address in the additioning view, 
which is where you want the names to have the conceptual significance that they do. But in the table, where you put in an extra column in the same table with a new purpose, namely to be wide, you'd have to call it email address underscore wide or email address primed or something, right? Well then, same again. You've lost that connection to its original spelling. So, see what I mean? You don't fuss too much about the names as they are in the table. If you want the names, you can easily find the names dynamically whether with a simple procedure that you could write who takes the name of the edition in view, looks it up in the metadata, DBA edition in views or DBA edition in view columns, and um, does the translation on the fly, right? So don't worry too much about that point. Um, now then, to complete the whole picture, I said that you know, a step in the middle and a notable step is going to be renaming all the tables and putting in additioning views. However, the owner of the additioning views has to be additions enabled, so that's at least one owner that has to be additions enabled. And you can't necessarily do that just like that, because doing that might violate the any on e prohibition. So now you see you have to make a plan by analyzing what you've got, when you realize what you've got, you may have to make micro plans for how you deal with table on type, how you deal with public synonyms, how you deal with materialized views and or virtual columns that involve, at least indexes on virtual columns, that involve um, additionable functions or views in their definitions. Right? All that, though, if you think about doing it in 12.1, is relatively straightforward to do. The net result of all this then would be a mechanically runnable script that you would run in the production version after having absolutely developed it in the normal way, thought about it a lot, discussed it a lot, and tested it in all the various ways that you test everything. In particular, you'd make sure that the transformation, the adoption script ran through without error, and then you'd want to do all your whole suite of regression tests. And you would expect that the tests, exactly as you have them, would now run with no need to test, sorry, no need to change anything in how the tests were spelt, and it would now just work again automatically. Right? So it's a non-trivial exercise, but something that you absolutely have to do. Not only would the scripts do what I said in this summary, but they would um, raise up all the triggers raise up all the policies of the three kinds, VPD, fine grade auditing, and redaction. And they would as well accommodate the fact that in any normal, well-done application, your objects are going to be distributed among many schemas, so they'd be bound to be cross-schema references to the tables, which indeed then would need to be allowed by privileges, like grant select on table T, to Scott, that kind of thing. And um, actually, it's just grant select on Scott to T, isn't it? Oh, sorry, Scott dot T to, to Blake. Anyway, you know what I mean. You would want to raise up those privileges too to the additioning view level. And you probably would want to be hygienic about it and remove them from the table. Because after all, you don't want anyone ever to access the table directly. Yeah? So that's another step that you would do in the great picture. Um, just the detail in that whole picture there. Um, just think about um, the surrogate primary key phenomenon. It, up to and including 11.2, then if you wanted a surrogate primary key column, you would set it up with the data type involved, typically integer, and you would um, populate it using a sequence. And to do that, you would have to write your own trigger, right? Um, so that trigger is a funny kind of trigger. It's not really part of the application logic. Rather, it's just a device to bring functionality that's really part of the definition of the table that Oracle happened through 11.2 to lack a declarative method for. But in 12.1, we've got a declarative method for that. It's called the identity notion. You know about that, I'm sure. You can create a table with a column whose decorated with the word identity. And then just by doing that, you get a trigger with an obscure name spirited up on your behalf. 
and the functional property that the, um, did I say trigger? I meant to say sequence. I can't remember what I said there. I'll say it properly. You get a sequence with a name that's just invented on your behalf that you can't control, who gives the next and the next value, and the functionality that your own handwritten trigger used to deliver is provided by some magic internal part of the C code that's just brought in on your behalf. It's like an internally implemented trigger that you never see. So clearly there, that guy is not going to be um, itself part of the discussion of additionability. So that would mean, had you been in 11.2 and you were adopting EBR and you had those um, triggers who are part of populating a surrogate primary key, it would make sense to leave them as not additioned. Of course, we didn't have a comfortable mechanism for it in 11.2. They, they would probably just go along for the ride and, for that matter, be at view level because you didn't think about it. But now, you see, ideally, they should stay at table level and be not additioned, right? As is the case in 12.1 if you use the identity notion. So that's a strange way of saying if you were adopting EBR and you had an app that didn't yet use this identity notion but used handwritten triggers, then considering you're doing so much refactoring, so much moving around, I would recommend getting rid of the handwritten triggers and moving over to the identity column idea, which you could do all during this downtime, one-off buying of your entrance ticket into the wonderful world of editions. Yes, makes sense? Now, that was one example. The other examples of data rules that you want to enforce, that ideally you would enforce completely declaratively, can't be done that way, and so you have to write your own trigger. And I would think there's a bit of a debate there. Would you consider that trigger to be um, something that ought to play in the wonderful world of editions or not? I tend to think not, because it's there enforcing specific concrete values in a specific table. And if you realize there's something buggy about it, you're going to need um, to do some more fundamental thing than just redefine it in a new edition and let it all work out, aren't you? You're going to need to do something rather more fundamental. And in th that case, I think even then, it would help to have the trigger still at table level and not as an additionable or additioned object. But I say that as an example, rather, not of me insisting that that's the proper way to do it, but of kind of edge cases where you need to think a bit and make your own mind up, okay? And there's one real concrete example, I may as well mention it. If you have a trigger whose purpose it is to keep a history of how a table used to be, or each time the table is changed to record the changes that, that, that happen at that moment, if you've got that kind of paradigm, then you'll find that if the rows vanish sometimes as a consequence of uh, having a foreign key declared with on cascade delete, then if the trigger was up at additioning view level, it wouldn't see the cascade delete. So you'd have to put that one down at table level. And again, I'm not saying so much Remember that, do that, remember that, do that. These are all the rules. They're rather elaborate. What I'm trying to say is that there are cases where you have to think of this just ordinarily, carefully, as you would think of many things ordinarily and carefully and make your own mind up. But in that foreign key case, it's just clear. You have to have it at table level if you want the thing to fire at all. Okay. Um, still with me? Um, what else might I say there? I think now, let me just see um, if I've said all that lot. Yes, I have, apart from the final point. So I'll, well, I'll just mention incidentally, there, what happens about constraints and indexes? First of all, they are most definitely properties of the physical world. They are intimately connected with the table, and that's all there is. When you do the renaming, they magically just come out right. If you look up the metadata for a index after you've renamed a table, it'll just automatically be seen to be on the table as it now has its new name. Um, it just is fine. 
Some, there, there are, I'm afraid there are a couple of things that are a little bit awkward here, and I'll mention them. One is that um, for reasons that have entirely to do with the difficulty of our internal implementation and that are not conceptual, we can't let you additions enable a user who owns a view which is involved in a referential integrity constraint. Might seem a bit crazy, but if you happen to have these kind of, um, what are they called, no validate, no rely constraints on views because you think it has documentary significance, you know, a primary key and a foreign key constraint on a view because it helps some kind of, loosely putting, modeling endeavor, you know, what's it called now? G investigating your schema um, kind of value. Well, there you're stuck, I'm afraid. You would have to rework such a subsystem rather manually uh, because the views that used to have constraints on them, even though they're no rely, non -val no validate, couldn't be there any longer. So the code that you were using that relied on them would have to be ordinarily humanly rewritten so that you consulted the metadata for the additioning view, found the constraints that were down there at table level, and computed them up and presented them for whatever consumer needed it. So there are, I'm not going to try to disguise the fact, some awkwardnesses involved in adopting EBR. But suffice it to say that these people I listed up, Salesforce and American Express and so on, they didn't um, find that these problems were in any way insuperable. They were able to overcome them and get it to the wonderful world that they wanted to. Now, the main point that I've been leading up to here is that uniquely, this is this point here, uniquely in the whole um, story of um, HA goals and meeting them with various pieces of technology, meeting the online, or I should say, meeting the zero downtime application upgrade is special. Because if you think about the counterexample, um, proofing yourself against earth earthquakes, you know, if some data center has just <coughs> not thought of this and suddenly the realization comes, my God, we're not protected, we'd better get data guard and implement it, then it's just the production database that needs an implementation of data guard and the superintendents of the installed production system have total discretion to go about that task and implement it, right? It's just a, just a question of um, things that you do in the deployed site, and you probably know that Data Guard works entirely off the blocks, and the blocks don't care what the hell the semantics of the bits and bytes in them are, and so therefore the adoption of Data Guard into an existing app has no consequence for and doesn't need to take account of the application semantics, okay? And it's like that if the aim is to do patching and upgrading of the Oracle database using the most sophisticated techniques available to do it with zero or minimum downtime, like rolling, upgrade, rolling rack upgrade or whatever it might be. The application semantics owners, the development shop, don't need to know or care you're doing that. EBI is unique in that whole gold space in that it's exactly the development shop who need to understand what EBR is and who need to work out how they're going to EBR ready their app. They need to write the scripts that will EBR ready the app and test them in the normal way that they would test the scripts that produce any patch or upgrade. And then they need to get the administrators of the installed system to agree to run those in downtime. And then thereafter, it's the, de it's the development shop who produces the scripts that run EBR style just in the same way that it was the development shop who used to produce the scripts that ran in downtime. Yes? Still with me? So this is uniquely and specially a development shop endeavor in the pursuit of um, zero downtime application patching. And when you have come, as you all have, hand in hand with me on the journey that's taken us so far, 
I'm sure you can see immediately that if you were working, or you don't have to be working there, if you contemplate some outfit where they don't have a single application that they've written themselves, all they have is bought-in stuff, maybe they run um, PeopleSoft for some reason, or maybe it's SAP or something like that, and maybe they have various applications from who knows where who help their kind of manufacturing process. None of this they control themselves. Maybe they're a customer of IFS applications, right? Um, if those customers come to hear of EBR at a conference, just as their staff come to hear of DataGuard at a conference, then if some higher level managers get the wrong idea at the customer outfit, for example, the place where they have an installation of ISF applications, and think, right, EBR, we'll go for that. We'll get our DBAs to do that too. They did a great thing with DataGuard. Let's get them to do EBR too. You see that's just an impossible thing. Impossible, because no vendor is going to let people on the deployed site change its whole nature by putting in additioning views, nor are they going to let any um, customer of the application at a deployed site respell the patches they ship. It's just um, completely non-viable. I'm sure you can see that. So the only um, hope that users of an ISB app have who understand EBR inside out and who want its benefits is to um, start a big political campaign, as I hope people are doing with you, to um, get the vendor to adopt EBR, right? Is that crystal clear? Um, I would hope that is utterly self-evident to you all, but I can promise you that I've been set up for conference calls by Oracle sales staff who don't understand that, and it's all a bit of an anticlimax when I have to sort of join a few dots and say that we've got nothing to talk about. Okay? Um, now then, I have various other important points to make, but I'm going to let them emerge in the context of um, the various things that remain ahead of us. And I think the first thing to do, absolutely without doubt, is um, bring you to the first rather rushed uh, climax, right? Um, I'll just show you the thing in a sketchy fashion, all in pictures, no uh, care and attention to the fine detail. Um, but it's nevertheless the complete thing in pictures. You remember this is what we were trying to do. We were simply trying to go from that old-fashioned way of doing phone numbers to a conventional modern way, the way all cell phones do it these days. And that meant changing the structure of the table, refactoring the data, changing the PLSQL code in the database. How do we do it? This is our starting point after some time earlier we did that one-time EBR adoption step. That was our very last downtime exercise. And now we're EBR ready, we're going to enjoy zero downtime for application patching and indeed application upgrade here on <coughs> after. Yes? So that's why we have the table. Here I've chosen to call it employees underscore just to make it easier to read on the screen. It's meant to be a stupid name that no one, apart from the additioning view, knows about. And it's got various columns in it, including a primary key and the old style, style phone number, right? And this is the additioning view that has the name that people like to think of. And this is the whole, it could be many units, but here I've drawn, drawn it as just one. It's the PLSQL that implements the hard shell, okay? And then now we want to start off and do the exercise. So clearly, well, the first thing we have to do is to create a new, a new edition and to switch in it so we can carry on with the other steps. There we have it. And notice that I've colored the, what we lo like to call the run edition, the edition that's in present use by the user community. I've colored it green, green for go. It's in use, it's available, it's accessible. And the brand new edition, I've colored it gray, meaning it's off limits. At the moment, only the EBR administrator who created it can see it. So I'm kind of hinting that you ought to have a user who you elevate to that status, the EBR administrator. And that user will at least create editions and drop them later on and do the housekeeping. Maybe 
you would still prefer to have less privileged users do the individual DDLs on various scheme objects during the exercise. That's up to you. Um, but certainly, the ordinary um, connect schema, this is in the hard shell thinking, the one that's empty and the one that has um, only execute on the subprograms that implement the API, that one um, does not yet have the use privilege on the new edition. So the outside of the database clients know nothing of what's going on. Right. So I believe that it's obvious, but you may not. Anyway, I'm telling you, the next step is to create the new columns that we need. Here we are. They didn't used to be there. Now they are there. It's easy for me to do that, but I don't know how up to speed all of you are with the thinking about the space that came in new in 11.1. So I'll just remind you, this is a busy system. In fact, we'll say it's so busy that considering the table employees underscore, there's never a moment except that that table has pending DML in it. Pending DML is just a shorthand for saying you've done insert, update, or delete, and not yet rolled back or committed. The changes you made are still pending. Okay? And in a busy system, given the number of concurrent sessions there are all in rapid fire with insert, update, and delete, you can bet that there's never a moment without pending DML. Okay? And if you tried in 11.2, no, sorry, wrong number. If you tried in 10.2 to add a column, you know, alter table T, add column C, some data type in that environment, you would instantly get an error saying words to the effect of I can't get the lock I need, error, bang. You're all familiar with that. In, of course, that would be just incompatible with the aim of EBR. So something had to change in that space, and it did. And as it happened, those changes were exposed in 11.1. And I don't know how much you know about that, so I'm going to play it safe and explain it in careful detail. So in 10.2 and earlier, there was nothing more to be said. Alter table style DDLs just had that character. If you attempted them in the presence of pending DML, you got an instant error. End of story. In 11.1, there's more to be said. In 11.1, we distinguish between two kinds of table DDL, and for that matter, index DDL. One kind is called non-blocking, and the other kind is called blocking. And the terms are fairly self-describing. Let me describe them. Um, just a foretaste of what's coming. Um, I keep on talking about this. You'll picture a green screen and a red screen, and a blue screen. And the red and the green screens are the screens that um, simulate ordinary ongoing end user activity, while at the same time in the blue screen, the EBR exercise is going through step by step by step by step. So now let's just consider a thought experiment. Let's consider, I'm not a thought experiment, an experiment you could do, and I encourage you to do it. Again. On your own laptop, all you need is table T, no more than that. Table T with one column, varchar 2, some size. And what you do is, in the green screen, you insert into table T values cat, and you leave it pending. You neither commit nor roll back. <coughs> and then, in the blue screen, you go alter table T, add column C, some data type, and you hit return. Does anyone know what you see in 11.1 under those circumstances? OK, well, I'll tell you. Either you're too shy or you don't know. What you see is exactly what you saw in that experiment that you all knew well, where in one session you insert cat, don't commit or roll back, and in the other session you also insert cat. It just uh, patiently waits forever until the first guy resolves something. Okay. So a non-blocking DDL is at least like that, in that it's just patiently waiting until you finalize the pending DML in the, in our case, green session. But the interesting thing is what happens now in the red session if someone does another DML in the same table. And in this regime of the non-blocking DML, the 
essential but nevertheless amazing outcome is that the red thing simply goes ahead, completely unaffected by the fact that the blue is waiting to get his turn to add the column. Okay? And the blue can wait forever and ever as long as the green never gets round to finalizing. Meanwhile, all other sessions can happily do what they always did. Of course, seeing the shape of the table as it exists before the DDL that the blue is still waiting to do has had effect. That's a non-blocking DDL. It's easy for me to describe, and it's clear why we use the word non-blocking. It's because the DDL, who is hanging there patiently waiting to get completed, doesn't block other DMLs that come after it. As it happens, it blocks other DDLs, but in a properly conceived EBR exercise, you're never going to have concurrent sessions contending with each other to do DDLs. You'll have them by intention coming out of a single session. So that's a non-blocking DDL. Not all DDLs have that character. The ones that do also have the character that they are implemented as a pure metadata operation. In other words, some change is done in the dictionary tables that represent the facts about the table in question. And such operations are, relatively speaking, instantaneous. And those are the ones that can acquire this character. Now, if you think of alter table drop column, for a start, you'll never be able to do that as such in the context of an EBR exercise. Alter table drop column is definitely not a metadata only operation. There's a real scanning of all the blocks and a reshuffling of stuff. A real thing happens. And the bigger is the table, I mean, the more rows the table has, the longer is the whole process or the whole time it takes to drop a column. As such a thing is very definitely not new style. It's still a blocking DDL. But one thing changed, and that's we've got a timeout. You may have heard of this. There's an initialization parameter. So if you go alter session set DDL lock timeout, the number is in seconds. If you said set DDL lock timeout 10, it means then that in the session where you said that, such an alter table drop column DDL in the presence of pending DML that's still not finalized would wait patiently until 10 seconds elapsed, and then it would give the same error that it always used to give in 10.2. Can't get me lock, error. With me? So the key question now is what happens in this red, green, blue situation? The red, sorry, the green session puts in some pending DML and doesn't commit. The blue session says that this is T, you know, insert into T, values dog. Over here, we go, there's lots of tab columns in T, alter table T, Drop column C96. What happens? This one is hanging because before that we said alter session set DDL lock timeout 10. Over here, this guy tries to do something, you know, update T set C1 equals C1 times C2. This one uh, hangs waiting for that one to finish. And this one is uh, hanging waiting for that one to finish. Now you can see why it's called blocking. Yes, and um, that's the difference. Ideally, every DDL that you do during an EBR exercise on a table or an index will be a non-blocking DDL. Okay, got that? Uh, I will say something at this point because all these things matter and this is exactly an opportunity to say it. Um, in 11.2, not all the table DDLs that you would want to be such were yet such. They weren't all non-blocking. In 12.1, a couple more were brought in. As far as I've managed to think about it and convince myself with some testing, in 12.2, everyone that you would want to be non-blocking is. So that's another reason in any new adoption for thinking that you may as well use the impetus of going for EBR first to motivate going to 12.2, because by delaying going to 12.2, you're only putting effort, off putting off effort that you will eventually have to do, but while you don't do it and try to use EBR, you'll be working to solve problems that take noticeable programming effort that are already solved in 
12 2. 